we've been going down this route of analyzing standard inputs in the Laplace domain. And so uh, we've discussed how and why we want to build up the input signals that we are analyzing out of these uh, standardized uh, inputs and found their Laplace transforms. Uh, we've spent a little bit of time talking about standard um, input uh, or standard system types. And I've guided you along, hopefully, a little bit of the intuitive path of getting into uh, some intuition of sketching out what those responses will look like. Now, um, we've also done a little bit about the calculation, uh, but I'm going to try to generalize some of the things that we spoke about last week with respect to first and second order systems into a form that works for generalized systems in series. What happens when... What happens when I've got a, a step input going into one tank, but then another, but that output going into a second tank? And that led us to this idea of having a second order system, because we had two differential equations, uh, and we ended up uh, right at the end saying that that was a special kind of uh, second order system, which was a critically damped or an overdamped uh, second order system. We could reason through the discontinuity in that input signal and say because the input signal here has a discontinuity and because that occurs on the right hand side of a first order differential equation, in other words we have a derivative equal to that thing, we could reason through that either mathematically or by just thinking about the actual mechanics of what a tank would do if you started uh, immediately filling up uh, the tank. We could reason through that to this idea that, the, that that moment at the response where time is equal to zero, we would have a continuous response because we have a differential equation, but that uh, response would have a discontinuity in its first derivative. And we, we said that that discontinuity in the first derivative we could characterize as being a sharp corner. Then, if we took that same kind of shape of response, in other words, if F1 now responded to that level rising in the same way, so we could see uh, if N has this kind of uh, this discontinuous shape, and then if 1 has a continuous shape with a sharp corner, if we fed that into a second tank, we could then reason that due to the same kind of idea that that would be the right-hand side again of a differential equation, now we would say that that means the response would have a smooth response. And smooth here in the sense that it had a zero first derivative. Right? So things with zero first derivatives, if you, if you plot anything that has a uh, zero first derivative, or, sorry, a continuous first derivative, you'll see that you have this kind of smooth nature. And now mathematicians like talking about N smooth. So they generalize this idea to saying, well, you get kind of orders of smoothness. If you have continuous first derivatives, that's like first order smooth. If you have continuous second order derivatives, that's second order smooth and so on. And you can go all the way up and say that you have like as many smooth first derivative or as many smooth derivatives as you would like or continuous derivatives as you would like. And as you do that, curves get smoother and smoother. Um, but the most noticeable one is the one that goes from the place where we have sharp corners to the place where we have no sharp corners. Okay. Now, when we look at the shape of these two differential equations or these two tanks in series, I, I ended up, yes, uh, last week, by saying, well, we could see the shape of the overall transfer function here because we know that there are two transfer functions in series. And so there's a transfer function that corresponds to this first tank, which is this uh, 1 over tau s plus 1. And if that's an identical tank over there, we have another 1 over tau s plus 1. In this particular case, when we were talking about the flow rates instead of this, the levels, we know that the gain of these transfer functions will have to be one. Is everybody following why that would be the case? Okay, 
Remember that the gain of the function gives its steady state output given a unit step input. And because this is a tank and because these are flows, the steady state of that system is that the output is equal to the input. And so if I have a unit step in the input over here, I expect that after a long time, that, that flow will, will, will eventually catch up to the inflow because that's what steady state is like for tanks. Is that making sense to everybody? So we know that the gain from the flow to the flow, from the inflow to the outflow of that tank, needs to be one for this to be a stable system. So does that make sense to everybody? Okay, because that, that follows directly from the mass balance. Another way of thinking about this is if we go to the differential equations over here, um, remember that having the, um, actually, where's the original differential equation? If you, if you figure this differential equation in form, remember this is F out, right? And so if, if that's zero, then F in must be equal to F out. Does that make sense? Okay, so you can see it from the math or you can see it from kind of reasoning through the, the, the behavior of the system. But the eventual value uh, will be one. And so I just wanted to recap this because I think I slipped it in quite uh, quickly towards the end of the lecture there. So I, I would like you to be able to uh, be roughly as fluent as I am in these lectures with writing down these differential equations, right? These things follow. Uh, so you should be able to kind of ask yourself, if I, if I increase that thing, and this is now a flow rate, but if I increase any of these inputs by one unit, by how many units will the associated outputs change? And so it's easy in things like flows, but you can kind of imagine that if there's a relationship between the input and the level, uh, you can also reason about how much additional level I'll get when I increase the flow by a certain amount. Does that make sense? Now, an interesting thing happens when we look at this differential equation or, or, or this transfer function over here. We can see that it's a factored out polynomial, but it's a second order polynomial. And everybody hopefully can see that if I multiply that out, I end up with a second order transfer function that looks of this shape. Okay, so this is the this is the standard, this is what I call the standard form, also what the textbook calls the standard form of the um, second order transfer function. In the in the standard second order form, we can recognize this um, second order term, the, the quadratic term. In this case, it's got a tau squared, and you remember this was tau is plus one times tau is plus one in the, in, the second, in the first order case. And if you multiply that out, you'll be exactly in this form except that in the particular case that when we clear those, uh, when we multiply out, when we get this uh, tau s plus tau s term, we'll end up with two tau s and there won't be a zeta, right? So um, in a certain sense, if you look at the relationship between this system and that system, it's clear that this is that with zeta equals one. Is everybody following? So I do expect you to be able to mentally multiply out those polynomials really, really quickly. Um, almost all of the rest of the subject, when I say almost all, I say like the theory part, or let's say the operational part, the part that you'll be doing math with is 95% like manipulating polynomials. And so you will, you will need to become incredibly fluent at manipulating poly polynomials. Part of that is I do expect you to be able to multiply these out by hand. I don't expect you to necessarily be able to factor them by hand, although it's quite useful to be able to recognize the relationship between that and that. Um, eventually, we'll be working with general polynomials. Towards the end of the lecture, we're going to get there. Um, and it's important for you also to kind of be familiar with the general properties of polynomials. Now, again, it's not really in the subject. I will be recapping a lot of the theory of polynomial roots and complex numbers and so on.
but we're going to be dealing a lot, a lot, a lot with uh, polynomials in the form of these numerators and denominators of transfer functions. Uh, it doesn't take much to go from the two examples that we've seen so far, where we've manipulated our system equations into a transfer function that looks like a numerator over, the, over a denominator and both of them being polynomials of S, to kind of see that that's going to be the general case where we're going to see all transfer functions in the subject are going to be polynomial functions over polynomial functions, in other words, rational functions of S, optionally with a delay term. The delay, if you'll recall from um, our discussion of the standard functions, is associated with an exponential. But we'll get there. So that's basically the complete family. And so it's useful for us uh, to kind of see this relationship. And something very interesting happens um, as we include this zeta term. Let me just execute this. So a lot of what I'm going to talk to, uh, to you about today, I'm expecting you to remember from when you were doing mathematics and specifically when you were doing complex roots of polynomials. Because I want you to understand that there's something very special that happens when we enter second order polynomials. Linear systems can not have, linear systems with real coefficients cannot have complex roots. So let me repeat that again slowly. If we are trying to solve equations and we are trying to solve linear systems, if the coefficients, in other words, these things that are, are next to S, if those things are real, there's no way to get a complex root. Does that make sense? I can, I can get complex roots if I have complex coefficients out of linear systems, but I can't get complex co uh, roots out of uh, systems with real roots if I just have linear and constant kind of uh, expressions. Now, you will recall that the moment, the place where you first hopefully, or probably first encountered the idea of a complex number was in investigating the roots of polynomials, right? So we talked about the nature of the roots of uh, second order transfer, uh, of second order polynomials, and we saw that there was this thing called the discriminant, right? Which told you, and if, if you, I think almost everybody, the thing that they remember, like really have a good rote memory of is most of you can from memory write down the quadratic formula, right? And most of you will remember that there's a square root in the quadratic formula and quite obviously <coughs> if that square root contains a negative number, then the roots will be complex. Now, let me just walk you through uh, some of the difficulties that arise as we generalize into these second order systems, okay? So if you remember how simple the inverse transform was from, for, for first order systems, and maybe let me just remind you what that looked like. Hopefully some of you by now can actually write it down from memory as like one minus e to the uh, minus t over tau, right? Um, that's the step response of a first order system. So it's a, like a really simple, short, like pithy equation, no issues. There you go, it's right here. That's, that's, the, that's the step response over there. So one minus, one minus e over t minus, uh, one minus e to the t over tau. Um, now let's compare that to the inverse of this generalized second order system. And we can absolutely do this with SymPy. And so we can see if we, uh, if we do this, and it takes a while. We arrive at this nasty thing over here. Okay, so this is the generalized, this is like the, the inverse Laplace transform of the step response well, that is the step response in time for a generalized second order system. So remember, that is parameterized by these two parameters. You'll see that the K, and I want to call your attention to this idea. It's kind of one of the reasons why people love having K in the formulas because it makes for easier plug and chug. But like, I don't like having them there because it leads to poorer intuition. But I want you to notice that it doesn't really matter whether the k is there or not, because in the output, it just gets multiplied by k. That's the only place in the whole inverse that k appears, 
And so really the juice of this, so like the, the bulk of that weird inverse response uh, or that weird response is all in these cosines and sines and like, you know, there's a ton of them. But you can kind of see that that is not something that you would readily commit to memory, I would imagine. I'm not like, not doubting your abilities, but uh, me personally, I wouldn't be able to do it, okay? Um, but I want to call your attention to one or two key facts. And the one key fact is all the way through this whole thing, you'll see a lot of square roots featuring zeta plus one in a square root. Okay, so that's a very key idea. So just like remember that that was the case. The other thing that I want you to see is that there are tons of sines and cosines. Okay, so there's not only the exponential response that we expected from a first order system, but also these uh, sines and cosines. And that's going to have a very, uh, that's going to have a very uh, specific effect, which we're going to explore when we, when we look at what that step response looks like, where we had effectively two first order systems in series. And we can see that um, we just have to kind of relearn a couple of things about the, the default response that you may, um, that may be a little bit unexpected until you kind of see the idea of these systems in series. The first thing is the time constant is now associated with a much smaller, actually, let me just get this to, to one. So I've set k equal to one now, and you can see that that's the eventual value of the step response, as, as we expect. This corresponds now to those two, two systems in series. We had the two tanks in series with a gain of one and some time constant, and it was exactly the same, just multiplied together, two first order systems in series. Now, notice that with the first order systems, we expected that time constant to represent a place where it achieved around 63% of the final value. Now, because we have these two different times in series, the response is significantly slower with respect to the time constant. So at the time constant value, we now have a value that is much closer to a third than to two thirds. Okay? And so already you have to understand that if we start putting these things in series, you won't be able to memorize the rules straightforwardly to say, well, the time constant is just always the time at which we get 63% of the final value. The time constant is always a thing in the standard form that parameterizes time or that, that gives us a sense of scale of time, but it isn't always chosen to make the time domain things easy. It's usually chosen to make the math easy. And so you'll see that that tau squared term arose from multiplying these two first orders in series. That's why tau is squared in the second order form. Does that make sense? This uh, zeta term, I'd also like you to think of the zeta term almost as an add-on. So if we start from these two first order, two identical first order systems in series, and we end up with that thing but with no zeta, then we could say, well, it seems like there's an extra degree of freedom available to us. Maybe those two aren't identical. Maybe they have different time constants, right? And maybe they, the, the system isn't actually two first orders in series at all. Maybe it's just some kind of a general uh, second order system. So when we add in this zeta on that middle term, what happens is you'll see this no longer easily factors back into two first orders. There are some values of zeta for which that can happen, but most of the time you can't simply look at that and say, oh yes, well, uh, clearly that used to be two uh, first orders in series. And now, specifically what happens at some very interesting values is if we look at this in analytic solution to the step response. Remember I called your attention to this idea that zeta plus one repeatedly occurred in all of these different terms. And it becomes clear that if we have a zeta equal to one, then that term is one itself. And if we have a zeta larger than one, and actually, sorry, there's another 
very important place here. These are the, mo the more important places because here we see zeta minus 1. Now, if you work out the determinant or the, uh, if you work out the discriminant, which remember that's the, that's the part inside of the square root, you'll recognize the shape of this formula as being the, the formula, right? So that's the, um, I can't even remember the formula myself, but it's the quadratic to a, a minus b plus or minus uh, square, root square root of whatever, whatever, right? You'll see that shape over here. This part comes from that discriminant. And you can see very clearly if that I've highlighted over here, if that term becomes negative, then this square root will become imaginary. Right? And so clearly, when zeta is equal to 1, notice what happens. When zeta is equal to 1, those roots are repeated. Why do I say that? Because when zeta is equal to 1, zeta minus 1 is 0, and that part, the plus minus part, falls away. And I'm just left with minus zeta over tau twice. Now that corresponds very cleanly to what we saw here. We can see very clearly that when zeta is equal to 1, the roots of this polynomial is minus 1 over tau twice. Does everybody see why that is the case? So let's just unpack that. What are the roots of a polynomial? The roots of a polynomial are the places where that polynomial becomes equal to zero. Okay? If I were looking at the first order system and I'm looking at the roots of that denominator, I see that this can be zero in, in two identical ways. We have to, like say it like this because there's this thing called the fundamental theorem of algebra which you'll remember that says that every polynomial of a certain order has exactly that order of roots they may be the same but we don't say that that polynomial has only one root we say that it has two roots that happen to be identical to one another this is just an important distinction okay so when i look at that you may colloquially say, and if we plotted that equation, we would see that there's only one place where it goes through the origin, uh, where, where it goes through the zero point. But we would say, and mathematicians force us to say, that all polynomials have exactly the number of roots that their order is. And so I would say that that term could be zero, or that term could be zero. And if that term is zero, if tau is plus one is equal to zero, then s must be equal to minus one over tau. Is that following for everybody? And so that minus 1 over tau is exactly the root that we get over here when zeta is equal to 1. Because when zeta is equal to 1, this whole, all of these square root terms, uh, well, that square root term becomes 0, which means that that whole term falls away, and we end up with what minus zeta over tau. We remind ourselves that zeta was 1, and so we have minus 1 over tau and another 1 y minus 1 over tau. Is this following? Right. Now again, if we look up here, when zeta is equal to 1, quite a lot of these terms just fall away. And most importantly, what I want you to notice is that the terms that fall away are all the terms that feature sines and cosines. Right? And so we have all of these sines and cosine terms Every one of them, if you look closely, here's a sine term. Let's look for the place where zeta makes it equal to zero. There's a zeta minus one. Let me just zoom into that. So there's a zeta minus one associated with that sine. There's a zeta minus one associated with that cos. There's a zeta minus one associated with that cos, and so on. And if you, if you, if you walk through this, if you substitute zeta equal to one into this, the whole thing collapses down to be just a exponential again, or actually two exponentials. Is that following for everyone? Okay, so we can clearly see that there's something special about zeta. We haven't chosen zeta completely arbitrarily because zeta tells us about the nature of the roots of the polynomial and the roots of the polynomial tell us something about the nature of the response. 
when zeta is 1 or larger than 1, then uh, the sines and cosines uh, aren't there. It's easier to focus on the equal to 1 case because we can very clearly see there's no movement of, of the output uh, in that case. And so let's look at this uh, in, uh, in analytic form. So if I take the inverse Laplace response of a very large value of zeta, we can clearly see that in that case, with the zeta larger than 1, I end up with the response being explained by two exponential terms. Now, I want you to just re recall back to last week where I reminded you, and I, I do want you to be au fait with this. So if you are not, if you don't really understand what I'm saying now when I'm talking about the solution of linear differential equations using the method of unknown coefficients, please go and revise that section of your mathematical uh, history. You did many of these, so many, like you got sick of it, right? You choose a kind of a shape for the for first order systems, it was always an exponential, right? You always needed as many exponentials as you had order of the differential equation. So for a first order differential equation, you only needed one. For a second order differential equation, you needed two. And you needed those two to be independent of one another. And so you analyze these things. In, at the time when you did this, you would have used a thing that you at the time called the characteristic equation. Does this make, does this ring a bell? Now, it turns out that the denominator of a transfer function shares roots with the characteristic equation of the differential equations that it represents. I'm going to say that again, but really, really slowly. The denominator, in other words, the bottom part of a transfer function, that is a polynomial. The roots of that polynomial are the same as the roots of the characteristic equation of the differential equations that gave rise to the transfer function. So if you remember the characteristic equation of the differential equations, you will find that you'll get exactly the same roots if you take the uh, roots of the denominator of the transfer function. And so you'll remember that you did these analyses. You calculated the roots of the characteristic equation, and then you made a call about how those roots were. So if you had distinct real roots, then you just used two exponentials. If you had real repeated roots, then you used the differential equation and the, you used the exponential and t times the exponential. And if you had complex roots, then also if they, they were distinct, but then you had the sines and the cosines. So that ring a bell for everybody. Okay, this should be very, I, I just remember having done so, so many of those when I was doing differential equations. You just go through the pattern. The only thing I ask you to remember is that there was this pattern, right? That you calculated the roots of the characteristic equation and you made this call, or you had this branching thing. Like if the roots were distinct, then if they were real and distinct, you just used the exponential straight up. If they were repeated in any way, you had to multiply by t. And if they were complex, you had these sines and cosines. Right? And you went through that process a lot of different times. And you didn't maybe at, at the time exactly remember what you were doing, but you know how to do it. Okay? Just, so all you need to remember is, though, because I'm going to show you how that works out in the Laplace domain. And it works out exactly the same way. I just want to like, try and explain to you that this is not completely new knowledge. It's the same thing, but we're just Laplacing now. Okay? So what are we doing? So, so that kind of explains why are we calculating these roots in the first place? Why? Because they are the roots of the characteristic equation. We're just doing exactly what you did in differential equations, but we're doing it in the Laplace domain. And so it turns out that it's actually a lot easier to calculate the roots uh, in the Laplace domain because you're just calculating now is like obviously just the roots of a polynomial. But uh, we can see that we have two distinct roots, two real distinct roots when zeta is larger than 1. And that results in this inverse Laplace with the two exponentials. At this point, don't worry too much about exactly what the numbers are here. And I can, I can let you rest easily that, as I've promised before, 
I will never expect you to memorize the very complicated response formulas that are in the textbook. They, uh, you're always going to be writing with the computer in front of you. And for the cases that the textbook handles well, SymPy works just as well. And so you'll never require those formulas to do anything in the subject. Right? I'm never going to ask you like, to use those formulas and say, oh, no, but that formula was in the book. It was not going to happen um, for the response formulas. I will say that there are some formulas for specific response characteristics that are harder to derive. Um, you'll be doing that during uh, the TUT tomorrow. So you'll see how hard they are to derive. And in those cases, um, I, I do find it useful to have those formulas. But let's say moderately useful. So the actual response formula is completely useless. You don't have to study them. You don't have to look at them, except from a very far away um, view in order to recognize their shape. Because these are the important parts, right? That when zeta is larger than 1, the roots of the characteristic equation are distinct and real. And the solution to that differential equation features two distinct exponentials. When, the, um, when zeta is equal to 1, we have repeated roots. And now, just like in differential equations, we find it necessary to multiply by t. So when there's repeated roots, you get the base functions orthogonal by multiplying one of them by, by t. Turns out that the one coefficient is zero in this case. So the, the response is just really nice. But if you're trying to kind of make sense of this, yes, there are actually two exponentials here. There's one over here that you can't see because it's been multiplied by zero. And you recall that this happened from time to time when you did differential equations as well, right? Like you started with the two and then you calculated and it was like, oh, that's awesome. Like one coefficient is zero. The equation is simpler than I thought, but the kind of base generating equation is still second order. And then we have the, the interesting case. I'm just going to use 0.7 here as a uh, damping co And this zeta is also called the damping coefficient. And you'll see that as soon as zeta is no longer larger than 1, at that moment, and now you may be wondering, like, wait a minute, there's like tons and tons of sines and cosines over here. But um, it turns out that through some clever uh, trigonometric identities, you can kind of map that down into just like one, uh, one of these. Um, we're going to be expanding on that throughout the rest of the lecture, but like when you look at this, you can clearly see that that's a special new behavior. We now have the ability for the output to start oscillating, to go up and down. So in all of the other ones, we just had exponentials, and exponentials are easy monotonic functions. They only ever go from one place to another without ever going up and down. They just go down or they just go up, right? And we could see that if we played with a slider, we could see that that step response was just faster or slower. <laughs> but you can see they, it's almost all of it just looks almost exactly the same. Now, I've also, now this should now, once we've started analyzing the roots, this should explain why I have a whole different axis over here. So this is a time axis, but this is the complex axis. And actually what I'm doing over here is I'm plotting the roots of that polynomial. And what you'll notice as I move this curve around, you'll see that when zeta is, is larger than 1, that root just stays, those roots just stay um, kind of glued to the real axis. Just as we thought, you know, when, the, when it's... Uh, when we have two distinct roots or we have just one root that is repeated, all of them is real. But check this out. As soon as we move below zeta is equal to 1, look at that. At that moment, we now have a conjugate pair of roots. So these are the roots of the polynomial. And they are also called poles. We'll tease out why that could be uh, later, but the roots of the denominator are called poles. That's why they're labeled P. 
And what happens as we move zeta to be smaller and smaller, as you can see, that these poles move in this circular shape. And if, you, if you're thinking, wow, that looks almost like a perfect circle, it is exactly a circle. They, 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 um, it, it, uh, it maps out a circle for constant tau and k. Um, and you'll see that at the point where, z, uh, where uh, zeta is equal to zero, that pole ends up hitting, uh, becoming purely imaginary. So we now have two purely imaginary poles. Now, there's some really deep links here. What you'll see as I do that, so I've, I've been calling your attention to the poles now, but notice what happens. Remember in the analytic solution when zeta, the moment that zeta became less than one, we had complex poles or complex roots of the characteristic equation. Complex roots of the characteristic equation are associated with sine and cosine terms in the step response solution. And we can see that effect uh, a little bit more clearly if I make zeta quite small as an oscillation in the output signal. Now, especially if we, if we go much smaller, you can see that that oscillation becomes very pronounced. And so what you're seeing here is the product of an exponential and a sinusoid. The sinusoid is doing what sinusoids do, going up and down at a constant amplitude. And we're seeing a decreasing amplitude because of the fact that we're multiplying by this exponential decay term. And so what you're seeing there is just here we see the sine term and here we see the term that is making it go smaller and smaller. Just to avoid some confusion, this is the impulse response, not the step response. And so if you, if you really want to map the formula 100%, it's the red, it's the, it's the red line uh, on this graph. But remember that the step response is simply the integral of the impulse response. And so it's usually a little bit easier. The mathematics of the impulse response is simpler than the mathematics of the step response. So I find it kind of easy to imagine the impulse response and then just integrate it in my mind um, in order to get to the um, step response. But you'll get familiarity with this. So the key points that I want you to take out of this lecture is... First, and, uh, first order systems will never give us any oscillatory response if they just happen in series because they will only ever contribute real roots to the characteristic equation. We can only get oscillatory response if we have complex roots and those complex roots fundamentally arise from higher order polynomials. There's no way to solve the roots of a linear polynomial to get a complex root if all the coefficients are real. But as soon as I have second order, at that moment, I introduce the opportunity to have complex roots. 